Over my last few years of making Pokemon videos, I've seen a lot of people tell me which Pokemon games they like, which Pokemon games they don't like, ones they really don't like, and which Pokemon games are their favorite. The game that seems to be the most universally liked, however, is Pokemon Platinum, which released in North America in 2009 and fleshed out and improved the Sinnoh experience. We are so close to the release of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, another set of games are going to improve upon the Sinnoh experience. Today, we are going to be playing through Pokemon Platinum version, while it's still the definitive way to play through the Sinnoh region. That will probably change really soon, but to accompany us, I have this handy dandy official Pokemon strategy guide for Pokemon Platinum version. In case you're new here, hey I'm Papa C, or just C. And one thing we like to do around here is go through these older strategy guides while playing through the game, following these guides as closely as possible and trying to ignore my prior knowledge on Pokemon as much as we can in order to see if this really is the best way to beat the game and how effective these guides are. If you think that's cool, then consider subscribing since most people who watch my videos aren't even subscribed. And even if you are subscribed, also consider checking out my other videos too since if you like these videos, I'm sure you'll like these videos on your screen here as well. Now putting together a guide like this definitely takes a lot of work and also a lot of skills between things like writing and illustrating especially. And if you want to learn some more skills for yourself, that's where Skillshare, today's sponsor, is here to help. Skillshare is a fantastic online learning community with thousands of classes on topics like video editing, cooking, graphic design, and just about anything you want to explore and learn. There's many classes on Skillshare that interested me personally, like this class by Thomas Frank about productivity for creators that I recently started. This class applies to creators of all sizes, even if you're just starting out or thinking about starting out. It teaches you how to be more effective as a creator, how to stay focused, how to manage your time, and how to find yourself in your own creative space. The best part was there were also no ads to interrupt my learning experience since Skillshare is specifically curated on learning. There's always new classes being added to Skillshare and if you want to check out Skillshare for yourself, which I definitely do recommend, you can use my link in the description. The first 1,000 people who check out the link in the description will get a free month of Skillshare and since it's free, why not check it out while you can. Now taking a closer look at the guide, and wow, it's a thicky, and I stress the capital T-H on that one. A big chunk of it is just the Pokedex and post-game stuff like the Battle Frontier, but it totals for 624 pages. Compare that to the Black and White 2 guide, which is pretty thick as well, but nearly 200 pages shorter. The cover is super shiny, shows faded images of the Battle Frontier brains for some reason, as well as a Shaman Sky on the cover. It's an event-only Pokemon that you need an event-only item to obtain this form, so I'm not really sure why they went with this on the cover, when it would have looked better with just the three starters. On the back of the guide, it aggressively asks us if we have the guts to face Sinnoh again, which I sure hope we do. And it also says, there's only 492 Pokemon instead of 493, and the Pokedex is missing Arceus. Despite Arceus being in Diamond and Pearl as well, Nintendo did this weird thing with some of these older games where they would hide event-only Pokemon for years before officially revealing them for a movie or something, even though everybody already knew what they were years in advance. This guide also retailed for $20 in the US when it came out in 2009, and was double the price in Australia since Nintendo hates Australians, and for legal reasons, that's a joke. On the inside of the guide, we unfortunately don't have any of the cool posters it advertised since I got this guide used a couple of months ago, and the first Pokemon I see in here are the Kanto Legendary Bird Trio for some reason. And the following page says how what awaits us is an odyssey filled with heart-pounding adventure. Seeing this overly dramatic quote at the very start of the video makes me really happy because I also like to post overly dramatic things in my videos for no reason. A few pages down, we have a recommended path and then a Pokemon Trainer Primer that explains the basics of Pokemon like raising your Pokemon with TLC, how to catch Pokemon, that Pokemon can learn moves if you didn't know that, and a strategy for winning battles that shows all of the types as well as their weaknesses and resistances. Interestingly enough though, it shows Sudowoodo for rock type Pokemon and uses its original Generation 2 Kensugimori artwork, while Houndour, the Pokemon it uses to show dark type Pokemon, 
uses its new art to make Sudowoodo stand out a little bit. This whole primer goes pretty in-depth for about 30 pages, and also yells things at us like, use your tools and items. This finally brings us to the Sinnoh walkthrough with Cynthia along with her Milotic and Garchomp. Let's load up a brand new save on Pokemon Platinum version and hammer away at it to beat it exactly as intended. Okay, actually first I need to get another copy of the game. The guy doesn't say anything about the introductory sequence and only starts with when we appear in Twinleaf Town. It doesn't give us a name for our character or anything like that, but I noticed here under the main characters it says main character, then in parentheses, boy and girl for each of them, so their names must just be boy and girl. I then name our character boy and then just name the rival rival since the guide first refers to him as your friend and rival. We then meet our rival at his house and see a Wii video game console, wonder what games the hero likes to play. As we head up north, we are met by Professor Rowan and Dawn and get to pick our first starter Pokemon. It says to choose wisely, but doesn't give us much information at all on each of the starters besides their types and abilities. I end up just picking the water type Pokemon Pipla because it's a penguin and name it subscribe because, well, you know, and prepare for our very first battle against Rival. He has a Turtwig that just spans withdrawal and after we lay waste to his Pokemon, we check out Lake Verity and meet a mysterious man then talk to the Pokemon employee for a free potion, and make it into the township of Sand Gem Town. Since we love Pokemon, according to the guide, we have to thank Professor Rowan for our Piplup, and since he can tell we love Pokemon too, he asks us to help him fill out the Pokedex. The guide then makes note of Professor Rowan's fridge, which has plenty of delicious treats in it. I never even knew that Rowan had a fridge in his lab, let alone the fact that you could interact with it. At this point, I also decided to compare the Platinum Guide so far to the Diamond and Pearl Guide we looked at a little while ago. And although these games are very similar, the guides are still quite different from one another. I guess this is a good thing since it makes them even more different. And then from here, we have to stock up at the Pokemart, tell our mom that we're leaving, and then return to have Dawn teach us how to catch Pokemon. I notice here that the guide also has sections for way later in the game for when we return from the Distortion World here. So this guy looks like it'll have it's fair few instances where we have to flip back and forth. After learning how to catch a Pokemon, the guide says we should catch a Pokemon ourselves, so I caught a Bidoof and named it Legend, of course. This brings us into Jubilife City, where we are met by a mysterious man known as Looker, deliver the map to our rival at the school, get the Poketch and the Old Rod, and then head east to fight our rival again. The guide doesn't give us many tips for this fight and just says how with little effort and strategy, you can be victorious. That doesn't unfortunately apply to real life, but we do end up being victorious, and then the guide wants us to fish in this nearby lake with the Old Rod, so I caught a magic carp and named it Tuna. Then we go through the Orberg Gate and into Orberg City, the City of Energy, but one problem, the gym leader isn't in the gym. Before we find him, we have to catch a Machop and trade for this Abra named Kaza, then head into the mines to find Rorik. After we find him, he returns to the gym, and the guide says we shouldn't dally and should battle him right away. The guide says off for this battle, our best assets are water, grass, fighting, and ground moves, so I just use our starter Piplup to type trump his rock type team rather quickly and evolve into Prinplup once the battle's over. After defeating Rorik, I noticed we missed this part of the guy that said we should catch a Geodude in the mine to show this guy in exchange for a heal ball. For some reason, this part was after the part about Rorik's fight, which is why I missed it, and I didn't plan on using this Geodude, so I just didn't nickname it, but we do end up using it a little bit since all I've really used up until this point is our starter Pokemon. When we return to Jubilife City, we have to battle some galactic grunts and then head north through the ravage path where the guide says like four times how we need to use rock smash here on the other side, I caught a Buneary and named it Chad, and then finally make it into Floroma Town. The first thing we do here is do our very best by collecting some berries, then we have to go green and replant them. 
We only got one berry each when we picked them up, so replanting them means we have no berries after that. And don't worry, the berry pages are fully intact in this guide, and it even tells you the amount of time it takes for each berry to grow and what poffins each berry makes, making this the best berry page we've ever looked at so far. From here, we have to head east to help a father out, get the valley key, and fight Team Galactic Mars. The guide suggests electric, psychic, rock, and ice tights for her Zubat, then fighting tights for a Perugly, so Jew dude works great here since it has Rock Smash. I'm also noticing the guide has recommended ice a few times now and will recommend it for Gardenia's gym coming up soon, although I don't think it's even possible to get any ice type Pokemon or ice type moves at this point of the game. After dispatching her, we can head north and into the forest with the help of Cheryl. And the guide says Cheryl is a giver because she heals our Pokemon. When we make it to the exit and enter Eterna City, the excerpt the guide has about the city says, Eterna City is a city where modern buildings exist side by side with the shadows of the past. I had no idea that this city had such a weird dark lore to it, but our main task here is to fight Gardenia and her grass type Pokemon gym. Before we do that, we have to get a new Pokechap, get the Explorer's Kit, meet our rival, and see the statue, which is actually a Dialga and Palki at the same time, by the way, depending on how you look at it, then acquire the Cut HM from Cynthia. The guide says how Cynthia seeing our Pokedex brings back some memories for her, but what's her deal, really? I also want to quickly mention here that I also just realized at this point of the game, this is my first time playing through Platinum without doing any sort of Nuzlocke or other challenge. Back when Pokemon when Platinum version first came out, it was like the only Pokemon game I didn't get on release date for some reason, and when I first played through it, I did some weird challenge where I only used gift Pokemon, and literally every time since that I've played Platinum, it has been some sort of Nuzlocke or other sort of challenge, so finally playing through it the normal way and using an actual strategy guide for it is kind of cool. That only leaves the gym for us now in Eternus City, and it recommends that we use Fire, Flying, and Ice type moves, so I use our Prinplup with Peck, and this does not go well at all. Her Turchwig has Reflect and lowers our damage output, and since my only other useful Pokemon is Geodude, we fall rather quickly. I then decide to catch a new Pokemon to help, so I get Cascoon, leveled up to a Beauty Fly, and notice in the back of the guide where it details much more about each Pokemon, like your level up moves and all of that, I realized that we caught Cascoon at too high of a level where it can't learn any good moves for Gardenia, so I go back, catch a Wurmple instead, name it Mothman, which is kind of weird since I want to be a beauty fly, not a Dustox, and Mothman's a better name for a Dustox. But we do get Lucky and Evolved into Beauty Fly, where it learns Gust at level 13. This works wonders for Gardenia's gym as we hammer away at her with Gust to get our second gym badge against her Grass-type team. We then have to break into the Galactic Eterna building next to save the missing Cycle Shop owner. As we enter, we are greeted by Looker, disguised in some Team Galactic duds. We then take the staircase to Heaven Lee Items, nice pun there guide, fight Team Galactic Commander Jupiter, and save the Cycle Shop Manager. We got a bike as a reward which allows us to cruise down south through Cycling Road. Looks like the guide forgot a space in this part here too since the words look too close to each other and make it into Route 206. Wayward Cave lies on this route and we can help this girl named Mira in the Wayward Cave and catch a Gibble on the secret side that I caught and named Cynthia since it was a pretty high level. As we exit and continue along Route 207, we enter Mount Coronet and meet Cyrus again. The guide asks what's his deal, it also asks that about Cynthia's deal earlier. I don't know why this guide is fixated on other people's deals. Then the next page details some of the other in-game trades, one of which we already did in Orberg City, and the other only one we can do right now is in Eterna City, although the guy didn't mention that trade in Eterna City. On Route 208, we do get the Berry Searcher app, some berries, and some mulch from the Berry House. There's a man on this route to give us the odd keystone for later, and now we can go through the gates and into Heart Home City, the Town of Friendship. The first thing we do here is catch Judge Kira's Baneri and learn a bit about the Contest Hall. Then stop by the Poffin House to do some lovin' from the oven. Meet BB, who gives us an Eevee and also tells us about the computer network in this generation, and I named the Eevee Rover. We then get the goods from none other than Mr. Goods, of course, and visit Fantina in the contest hall. 
She then returns to her ghost type gym so he can challenge her and the guide recommends dark or ghost moves for her. Hey, so while editing this, I also noticed that it says dark type for Haunter and Haunter's not a dark type, it's ghost and poison. So another mistake in the guide, but it's a rather minor one that I noticed while editing. All right, back to you, past Papacy. We don't have any of those types on our team right now, so I checked the back of the guide to see what we can do. I noticed that Eevee learns Bite, a dark type move at level 29, so I leveled it up to 29 so we can type Trump Fantina. I think that this Pokedex section in the back part of the guide is the best part of the guide by the way since it details so much about each Pokemon and tells me pretty much everything I would need to know about them while a lot of other guides just straight up don't have a Pokedex or their Pokedex just simply lists all their Pokemon. This one has abilities, where you can find them, even some trainers that have them, as well as their full level up moveset and evolutionary charts. The actual guide though so far has been a little weird with flipping back and forth and things being placed in awkward spots, which is hard to show in the video, but for example, the guide put the part about the Orberg mine after the gym battle against Warwick in Orberg City, and you need to go to the mine first to fight Rorik, which is why I missed that first part about Geodude earlier on. Either way, our team is now prepared to fight Fantina and her team of ghosts, so we light up the Heart Home Gym with our Dark type moves, kind of ironic there. And after a few annoying turns of being put to sleep and confused and all of that, we finally get the third gym badge, largely thanks to our brand new Eevee named Rover and Printplug, which came in at the end to clean up once Eevee got low. We can now take a stroll in Amity Square with our Printplug, then head towards Solisian Town. On the following page, it says, Trees a crowd, continuing with these weird random puns every now and then, and explains honey and all this other random stuff here for some reason. Then on the following page, it has Route 209 and the Lost Tower. On this route, we can get a good rod from the fisherman, and Pikachu, is that you? We then use the odd keystone, but can't catch Spiritomb until after we get the national decks, and can climb the Lost Tower, although we'll have to come back here later on anyway. Once in Solisian Town, we get a Poketch app upgrade, leave Chad at the daycare to level up a bit, and potentially get an excellent surprise if we have two Pokemon that can breed in the daycare, then get the seal case, and get lost in the Silesian ruins trying to find the Defog HM, since the instructions were written in unknown. These are pretty simple to read, but it would have been nice if the guy just said what they were in actual English. We can now head towards Veilstone City, and the guide said there's ton of fun attractions there. On the following route, we get a dozen Moo Moo Milks, see some side ducks and make it into Veilstone City, an open space bordered by stone. Here there's a bit to do, like get the coin case, get a Porygon that I named Motherboard without the A because it didn't fit, and then get another Poketchap, gamble for a little bit, and then prepare to take on Maylene and her fighting type gym to get our fourth gym badge. Flying and Psychic type are key here, so I use Beauty Fly with Gust here and our newly acquired Porygon, which has the Psychic Move Psybeam here. Although they both end up falling because her Pokemon have Rock Moves for Beauty Fly and are Fighting type for Porygon. But we did manage to get all the way up until her Ace Lucario before they both went down, so I send out our recently evolved Graveler to finish off her Lucario, since the guide also recommended Ground types for her Gym and Fire types, probably just for this part steel type Lucario. Gibble also evolved around here into Gabite, and I noticed the guy didn't really have anything for the gym puzzle outside of just showing a full image of the gym. Some guys like to show you a step-by-step -step walkthrough of pretty much every puzzle in the game, and other ones like this just sort of throw you in there. When we exit the gym, we see Professor Rowan's assistant and have to help her fight off against Team Galactic Grunts. We then head into the warehouse to collect the HM for Fly after defeating them, then the following few pages detail the department store and game corner a bit more. For some reason, the guy doesn't mention the place you go to massage your Pokemon in order to boost their happiness here. Something that would be great for our Eevee as the back of the guide does say how to evolve Eevee into Espeon, Umbreon, as well as all of the other evolutions. There's a lot of information back here, by the way, that I never really know how to handle when guides have stuff like this. But since I do have an Eevee on the team, I think it's fair for me to check the back of the guide for how to evolve Eevee at least. Since when we first received Eevee, we were told that it does evolve into a few different Pokemon. With Veilstone City done for now, we can travel south to Pistoria City. 
On the way, we pass by Lake Valor and the Valor Lakefront, but the lake is closed because of a red Gyarados sighting and a lot of camera crews trying to record it. I always thought this was a little weird how in this game they focus a lot on this red Gyarados, even though there isn't an in-game event to catch one like you would see in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Once in Valor Lakefront, there's some things for us to do, and I always really like this area of the Sinnoh region. It's not its own city, but there's a lot of random places to go and things to do that you don't really need to do. Kind of like that big route around the Berry Master's house in Hoenn, which is a pretty large area that's totally optional and has a lot to do. Here we have some fun battling in the Seven Stars restaurant to level up our team a little bit, then use our dowsing machine on our Poketch app to help find this woman's missing keys. Then we head south a bit to Dr. Footstep's house on the beach, and the blurb here says, Feet don't fail me now, which sounds a bit weird. Once we make it into Pistoria City though, the first thing we do here is catch some Pokemon in the Great Marsh, like this Tangela that I named Sosa. Since we caught at least 5 Pokemon in the marsh, we get a new Poketch app as we exit, and then I decide to add Tangela to the team over Porygon. I then level up the team a little bit for the upcoming Rival Fight and Gym Fight, and Tangla evolves into Tangrowth here. I always thought that this was a tread evolution, but it turns out that Tangla evolves when it learns Agent Power, so I was surprised when it happened. We then battle the rival to dispatch him very quickly, then for Crasher Wake's Water-type team, the guide suggests Grass and Electric-type Pokemon to type trump him. Tangrowth should be great here to hit his Quagsire for 400% damage, and just to recap the team quickly, we have Rover the Eevee, which I'm going to let evolve into whatever it evolves into naturally via level up without using a stone, then Gabite the Cynthia, Sosa the Tangrowth, Mothman the Beautyfly, Subscribe the Empoleon, and Graveler the Graveler since I never nicknamed it. In the battle against Crasher Wig, he leads with Gyarados, which isn't weak to grass due to its part flying typing, but Sosa is still able to clear out this gym since Tangrowth is a really good Pokemon, especially in game. With five badges in our badge case, we see our rival as we exit the gym who wants to meet us in front of the Great Marsh with Crasher Wig to talk about Team Galactic. From here, the guide is a bit weird since we have to chase down the Grunt now and that section is a few pages back, but the next page shows Route 212 in the Pokemon Mansion. I just head for the mansion first, meet this shard-dressed man along the way who loves shards, and catch this Staravia in the Trophy Garden because the guide said to catch something here. And another funny task here is called Stealing Candy from a Blissey. This is to reference a once-a-day event where you battle five of these maids and have to defeat all of them within nine turns to get a rare candy, but unfortunately I was unable to do that and this is a once-a-day thing so I can't just retry it right now. This whole mansion though is another one of those weird, small, cool, random areas that you don't really need to go to, but you could spend some time here if you really wanted to and have some fun. I then go back to Pistoria to chase down the Grunt, meet Cynthia who gives us the secret potion, allowing us to go towards Celestic Town to see her grandmother. There's so much flipping back and forth here since we have to flip back over 20 pages to see the rat with the Psyduck since it's detailed before the Maylene fight. And since we need to use Defog on this route, I replaced Beautyfly on the team with Staravia so we can Defog this route and I also taught it Fly. We can go back to the tower near Solisian Town too so we can Defog it for the people on the top since the guide said to come back here when we learn Defog and I actually remember to go back here. Once we go through the route though and make it to Celestic Town, there's some small tasks to do here like get a random Specs item which happens to be the black glasses for us fight this grunt, and meet Cyrus yet again. Cyrus asks us if we're going to challenge him, and the guide says how you could just say no and write a report. I don't know what this means, maybe this is a joke that's just going over my head since that does happen sometimes with these guides. But we have to say yes and battle him in order to progress in the story, so I just battle him with our Graveler since the guide noted how his team is all weak to rock types. After defeating him, we can get Surf so we can hang 10 in different areas, then fly back to Jubilife City and head west into Kanalave City, or Kinalave City, I never know how to say this city, a glistening port town. We have to get ready to rumble against our rival on the bridge here, and the guide stresses that we should heal before we battle him, so I go and do that. We hammer away at our rival, then have a quick detour to Iron Island before fighting Byron, the Steel-type gym leader of this city. This is technically an optional area too, but I I do it anyway and the guide says leave an open slot on our team so we can get an egg 
after helping Riley here, so I deposit Staravia so we can just get the egg. When we're done helping out Riley, I return back to the city and we have to battle Byron, and the guy suggests fire and ground types for the best results. Gabite just learned Dig and Graveler has Earthquake, which is perfect for this gym. And although Gabite falls in the fight against Byron to an Ice Fang from Steelux that the guy didn't warn us about for some reason, Graveler is able to lay waste to the rest of his motley crew with Earthquakes. I notice here too that the guide references the Locked Harbor Inn, which is an event for Darkrai if you didn't know, and also talks more about Mr. Goods here, although we only see Mr. Goods back in Heart Home City, and the guide did mention to talk to him there, so I don't know why they stuck this section all the way here, expecting you to possibly go back to see him, when it would have made a lot more sense to have it back in Heart Home. As we exit Byron's gym, we are told to go to the library from our rival, who is champing at the bit about it, but are interrupted by an explosion and an earthquake. This was caused by Team Galactic at the Three Sinnoh Lake, so we have to go there to see what their deal is. This part of the guide doesn't have us flip back to the previous sections where we first visited the lakes, while in the original Diamond and Pearl guide, it did make us flip all the way back to Lake Valor towards the start at this point. The first step here though is titled Global Warning because the galactic bombs drain the lakes and that can't be too good for the environment. It then says how Magikarp can't catch a break because Team Galactic just left them flopping about as they weren't strong enough to be captured by them. Poor Magikarp. We meet Commander Saturn in the center with his cat ears and team of several different types. It suggests fire types for his Bronzor and does that a lot for random trainers here where it wants us to use fire types, which is funny since this game is notorious for having such few fire type Pokemon in it. I'm sure at least one person is going to comment saying I should have picked Chimchar because of that, but technically I shouldn't have known about the lack of fire types when we started since the whole point is to play through the game, trying to act like a new player and ignoring as much my prior knowledge as I can. After we dispatch Saturn though, we have to travel to Lake Verity to assist the assistant in a fight against Mars, then we have to travel all the way up north to the final lake, Lake Acuity. It then tells us to go through Mount Coronet in order to make it to Lake Acuity and Snowpoint City, but first says to go from the Eterna City side, then the next page says to go from the Celestic Town side, so I go from there instead. This part of Mount Coronet is very straightforward since we can exit rather quickly, even through this rock blocker along the way. This leads us to Routes 216 and 217, a winter wonderland. Here we find Snow Place like home where we can rest up our Pokemon. The guide is really ramping up the puns towards the end of this guide. And my Eevee finally evolves here into Aspion. I thought it might have evolved into Glaceon because we were pretty close to the ice rock around here. And then we pick up the Rock Climb HM and finally make it into Snowpoint City. There's a note here called Goodwill Haunter talking about the infamous Haunter trade where the Haunter's holding an Eevee Light and doesn't evolve. And then there's a couple of other events here that we can't do until the post game leaving just the fight against Gym Leader Candice and her Ice-type foes. Here the guide suggests fire types, again of course, as well as fighting types. I noticed here that the guide really hasn't recommended we caught specific Pokemon at pretty much any point of the game, where a lot of other guides recommend that you catch a specific Pokemon for an important trainer fight like a gym battle. I think it would have made sense to recommend that we catch a Medicham, which could be caught right outside of Snowpoint City, to help against most of her team, but instead I rely on Graveler, which has Rock Smash, our only fighting type move, so I use that for a bit until it falls since it's our only fighting type move on the whole team. I then send out Subscribe to finish off her crew in two shakes of a lamb's tail. This badge allows us to use Rock Climb to access Lake Acuity, where our silly rival lost to Commander Jupiter, meaning we have to go to Veilstone City and storm the Galactic Headquarters to stop them from their evil plans. It says to steal inside the base to save the captured legendary Pokemon, and maybe I'm nitpicking here because we tend to do that sometimes in these videos, but I feel like that sentence just doesn't make any sense. Like, I feel like they started writing a sentence, then halfway through decided to change the sentence, but left the first half, and this is what we got. The guy does have a map to follow through the base, though, helping us reach Cyrus for our second battle against him. The first line for this fight says how his whole team is weak to rock, then says you'll fight more effectively with a few of these listed types for each of his Pokemon, 
but doesn't list Rock again. I just use Graveler again for most of the fight and hammer away with Rock Blast to get a cool Master Ball as a reward when we win. We then have another quick fight against Saturn, and now we can go back to Mount Cornet again to access the Spear Pillar at the top to stop Cyrus's plan once and for all. The guide has a map to get to the top of Spear Pillar, but as you know, maps with more than two sections and me don't exactly mix so well, so I get lost trying to reach the top. We go across anyway and have no holes barred except for this one, and after we return from the distortion world, we can bar this hole. I'm really losing it with these puns the guide's trying to throw out. But when we reach the top, we then fight Mars and Jupiter with our rival, then look, Dialga and Palkia. The guide is then impressed by Giratina's appearance on top of Spear Pillar, and a hole into the distortion world opens that we have to chase down Cyrus into so he doesn't catch Giratina. The distortion world map is, well, distorting, and a big reason why I tend to prefer Diamond and Pearl over Platinum is because I really don't like the distortion world. But when we track down Cyrus, we fight him and all of his Pokemon are still weak to rock types, so we use Graveler to take him down. Funny how I didn't even name Graveler because I didn't think I would use it, and I only caught it because I needed to catch one to show some random NPC in Orberg City, but then I end up using it a lot, and after defeating Cyrus, we get to catch Giratina. I'm unable to catch it after weakening it a bit and using Ultra Ball, so I just throw my Master Ball on it and name it Cyrus just to make fun of Cyrus since he also gave us that Master Ball, and I don't even bother adding it to the team because I really like the team we have so far. Garchomp's a great Pokemon, I don't think I've ever used Tangrowth in a playthrough before, and Polian was our starter, Espeon's just Espeon, I kinda need Staravia to fly, and then of course there's Graveler. The guy then wants us to catch the Lake Trio, but I accidentally kill Uxie, then I accidentally kill Azelf, and Mesprit just runs away. Nice. I did at least buy Quick Balls because the guide did suggest we catch them, and it also suggested using moves like Mean Look to try and catch Mesprits before it ran away, but unfortunately I didn't have access to that move. That's pretty much it for Team Galactic at least, so we can now make our way towards Sunny Shore City. On the way we learn that size matters, sorry fellas, and make it into the intricately designed port town. There's a few small things to do around here like get some Poke Chaps and do some shopping, but the main thing is to fight Volkner's electric type gym. The guide says how ground type moves will rock him and ground him out sounds rather gruesome there so our recently evolved Garchomp and Graveler take care of him swiftly for our final gym badge. On the shore up north of the city we meet Jasmine who gives us the HM for waterfall and then shortly after meet our rival who gives us mad props. Yeah this guy was definitely written in 2009 if you couldn't tell. We then head north through the water route of Route 223 and into the Victory Road. It suggests that we use a luck incense while battling some trainers around here for some extra money, although it doesn't tell us how to get one, but it does give us a map to help us go through the Victory Road. The Victory Road in this game is pretty short and doesn't have all that much to it. There is this secret event that you can't access until post game, so for now we have to prepare for the last rival fight and the Elite Four once we reach the other side. This rival battle tab of course says very little about his team again other than the fact that his levels are higher than before, it says that they're 12 or 13 levels higher now, and what his team is depending on which starter you picked. I haven't really talked about it much, but this team page for our rival is always very bare compared to our rival fights and Cyrus fights which had more information. The rival pages in this game are actually very very similar to how the rival pages are handled in black and white and black and white too though. After laying waste to his team we buy some more items to help us prepare for Victory Road and step through the doors to the Elite Four. For Aaron it of course suggests fire type Pokemon against his bug type team and to focus on powerful moves like Drill Peck which Empoleon now knows and Earthquake. Earthquake against two flying type Pokemon. I know they meant to use Earthquake just against his one Drapion as Drapion's only weakness is ground, but nearly every other team member on Aaron's team either is immune to ground types or resists ground types and just doesn't care about them. I also noticed that the color for Yanmega's flying typing in the guide is red, but the regular flying typings in the guide tend to be blue and white like how it is on Vespaquen. Aaron goes down swiftly thanks to Empoleon, leading us into the fight against Bertha. 
For Bertha, it suggests grass and ice type moves against her ground type team, so I use Sosa to start off, and later on it recommends to use Surf, so I use Empoleon to get the upper hand. For Flint, I just spam the powerful moves of Surf and Earthquake as the guide recommended to get a very quick victory, and for Lucian, I use Crunch on Garchomp to eradicate his motley crew of psychic foes. We just happened to have one or two Pokemon that completely destroyed each of these Elite Four members so far. And all that's left now is the champion, Cynthia. The note for Cynthia says to be flexible and come in with different move types and recommends a specific type for each of her Pokemon. I of course have an honor battle against her Garchomp and win. The guy didn't suggest that, I just couldn't resist. And although she was much harder than the other Elite Four members and I did have to use quite a few revives, we end up using Garchomp to finish off her final Pokemon 2 in Roserade. It goes down to a dig and with that we beat Pokemon Platinum how Nintendo intended. This was a lot of fun to do and and it did take a bit longer than I expected as my playtime in this was like 28 hours, even though we didn't really run into any trouble throughout the game. We had a great team throughout, and I found it funny how under Cynthia there is a little text box here that says if you lose to Cynthia, you should pinpoint her weaknesses and know when to switch out your Pokemon. A bit too late for this information now as it's pretty basic battling information to have, but I guess it's better late than never, I suppose. The guide itself wasn't really that great either, mainly because it had more flipping around, especially in the first half of the guide. The second half had much less of that, and there really weren't that many mistakes or anything like that in terms of the regular walkthrough, but it did feel like it had a bit less than some of the other guides we've looked at, especially coming off that awesome red and blue guide. I thought that since the guide was so big it would have a lot more information for the actual walkthrough part, but that was really just reserved for extra information like the berry pages, which is a plus in its own right though. There is a little bit in the back for some of the post game and its events too though. Platinum really is a great Pokemon game, arguably the best in the series, and I'm glad I was able to get to it before the release of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl very soon. It's weird how this was the only main series game I decided to skip upon release just to come back to it a couple of years later and have it be one of my favorites in the series. It's not perfect, but it does a good job of trying to improve upon the regular Diamond and Pearl games. I think I still prefer Diamond and Pearl because of, one, nostalgia to be honest, and two, because I skipped this game when it first came out. If you do enjoy these videos though, I highly recommend you subscribe and leave a like, and also check out my other non-intended videos, since I still get people who comment on my videos not realizing that I upload other videos besides these intended videos. I only upload intended videos once a month or so, but I still upload once per week on Saturday, so you should check those out. I'm sure you'll like my other videos, like my my hardcore Nuzlocks and other Pokemon videos, like these hardcore Nuzlocks that I'll link in a playlist in the description, where I only use Pokemon of a certain color categorized by the Pokedex. It's a bit more unique than regular type locks that have been done with pretty much every type by now, but I have done some type locks too if that's your thing. With all that out of the way, I want to thank you all so much for watching, hope you have a great rest of your day, I will see you all next time, and bye bye.